Why aren't I talking? Okay, I don't know. Sorry, I, I, I suddenly blanked out. I, I hit record and then I didn't know what to do. I guess I should talk. Hi. More, on, <clears throat> pardon me. Mm. Just had lunch. More on capacitors. Uh, specifically, I want to go back to what we were talking about about uh, dielectrics in the last recording. Uh, I talked about dielectric, which is uh, the more technical term for uh, an insulating material. And I said that if you insert a piece of dielectric in between the uh, plates of a capacitor, then the uh, electric field of the, uh, that uh, is created by the charge on the capacitor plates uh, tends to polarize um, the molecules of the uh, dielectric. And the result is that that induces a second electric field uh, inside the dielectric uh, due to the um, rotation or the uh, stretching of the uh, molecules of the dielectric. In any case, uh, the induced electric field points in the opposite direction of the capacitor's electric field. So the total field between the plates of the capacitor has been reduced. Since the total field has been reduced, the total potential difference between the two plates has also been reduced. And specifically, the potential difference between the plates has been reduced below the potential difference of the battery that is driving the charge onto the plates in the first, uh, in the first place. As a result, the potential difference with the di dielectric is uh, somewhat smaller than it would have been if there had been no dielectric present, which means, in turn, that we can store more charge in the capacitor. Because remember, as the potential difference between the plates rises only when you transfer or I'm sorry, only when you store more charge uh, in the uh, capacitor. So anything you can do to a capacitor that will tend to decrease the potential difference uh, will uh, therefore allow you to store more charge, and that's exactly what a dielectric does. That's cool. And, and I may have mentioned, I forget, but anyway, um, this is done because the whole purpose of a capacitor is to store charge and, or to store electric potential energy, depending on your point of view. Uh, and doing this is a very cheap, very easy way to uh, increase the storage capability of a capacitor. All right. So let's uh, take these ideas and put some uh, put some equations to it, or at least some calculations. Now, from time to time, the uh, concept of the permittivity uh, has come up. You remember epsilon naught? And I've just been sort of hanging around with it, or ha having it hang around. Uh, and the first place we ever saw it was in Coulomb's Law. Uh, and uh, the, um, so I'm, I'm going to write this down temporarily and then erase it real quick. I just want to remind you what epsilon naught is. So we first saw it in Coulomb's Law, uh, where I wrote originally f equals qq over r squared. Where K, I said, at some point I told you that the way of calculating the value of K is the following expression, getting myself a better pen here. One over four pi epsilon naught, and there's the epsilon naught that I'm talking about. And epsilon naught, I said, was the permittivity of vacuum. And I told you when I first introduced it, that the permittivity, permittivity is just some constant that we're going to carry around with us and that someday I would explain to you its physical significance. Well, today is today. Before I uh, insert the dielectric in between the capacitor plates, or more realistically, if I were to build a capacitor without a dielectric that only had vacuum, between the plates, there was nothing between the two plates, which is certainly possible, and it is it is done. By the way, sometimes that's we want to do that for technical reasons. In that case, the there is still an electric field in the region between the two plates. The vacuum uh, does nothing. Uh, as a, sorry, the electric field does not require uh, anything uh, between the plates to exist. It's simply a property of the of the charge on the on the top plate and on the bottom plate. And the, uh, the electric field, uh, the way we're sort of imagining it, pardon me, uh, the electric field 
travels, quote unquote, from the uh, positive charge uh, distribution to the negative charge distribution. And in, to be honest with you, uh, it actually does travel rather literally through the vacuum. But it doesn't do so with uh, zero difficulty. Uh, and there, there are things about vacuum that uh, affect uh, how uh, easily, how quickly the electric field can propagate through empty space, through vacuum. And uh, we have a number that characterizes that, uh, how easily or not um, electric field propagates through vacuum. And epsilon naught is that number. It's a number that, that tells us how easily, uh, an ele a, a, sorry, how easily a vacuum permits an electric field to travel through vacuum and how easily a vacuum permits the electric field to go from place to place, to go from the positive plate to the bottom, to the negative plate. And in SI units, this thing, and you've seen this before, I know, but uh, anyway, 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 uh, Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. Now, the units don't, in my present uh, discussion don't have any particular significance, and indeed, uh, in the context of capacitors, epsilon not usually is given different units, but let's not worry about it for right now. Uh, okay. Well, perhaps it makes sense then with that uh, uh, description that um, the, uh, the dielectric through which the electric field is now uh, trying to travel, uh, the, uh, a dielectric material, or an insulating material, would uh, permit, and it's called a permittivity of vacuum, it would permit, uh, let me finish that sentence, it, perhaps it makes sense that the dielectric would permit the electric field to travel through it uh, with different uh, uh, easiness, I guess, than vacuum would. And in fact, that's true. And it turns out that vacuum uh, is the medium, the stuff, the, the environment, uh, that electric fields can travel through most easily at all, of all, and maybe that makes sense. There's nothing at all to interfere with the electric field. So anything else other than vacuum, air, or plastic, or wax, or water, or, any, or anything else, uh, ceramic, uh, they're all going to have primitive, uh, a value of permittivity also. But the permittivity is going to be larger than the permittivity of vacuum. And that's simply because it's harder for electric fields to travel through things other than vacuum uh, than it is for it to travel through vacuum itself. In other words, to say in reverse, it's easier for electric fields to travel through vacuum than it is for electric fields to travel through anything else. And again, hopefully that makes sense. So all materials have this property of permittivity. It's just that for technical and mostly theoretical reasons, the permittivity that vacuum has is usually more important or anyway more useful. Uh, in most situations than the primitivity of anything else. Uh, but uh, if we do have something other than vacuum and we want to talk about its primitivity, we use the same symbol except we leave off the subscript zero. We just call it epsilon. And so uh, the putting the subscript zero on there is your visual alert that the number that you're looking at is the primitivity of vacuum exclusively. If you don't mean vacuum, then you simply call it epsilon without any subscript at all of t of not vacuum, yes. Okay, so this is the permittivity of vacuum, and if you have anything else, you just call it epsilon. And then in order to know what the number is, you have to look it up on a table, okay, or whatever. Okay. Why am I telling you all of this? Well, because the, the uh, effect that I described earlier for the dielectric uh, can be characterized uh, in terms of the permittivity. Uh, the closer the permittivity of our dielectric is to the permittivity of vacuum, the uh, less effect the uh, dielectric has on the capacitance. Uh, and so, uh, and, and again, maybe that makes sense. If I, if I had, a di which there is no such thing, but if I, if I had a dielectric whose 
primitive value for its primitivity was essentially exactly the same as the primitivity of vacuum, then how could the capacitor tell that the uh, dielectric was even there? It, it would just it would look just like vacuum to it, and so uh, the uh, the larger the permittivity of your your dielectric, the bigger the change in capacitance, and the more charge you can store. Okay. So uh, what will what what turns out to be useful is to define a value that is simply the ratio of the permittivity of your dielectric over the permittivity of vacuum. And so we'll do that. And it has a very sensible name. It's called the dielectric constant. Is the, the symbol is the Greek letter kappa. Looks like a K, but it's the Greek letter kappa. It's drawn kind of curvy like this. And it's simply, as I said, the ratio of the permittivity of your dielectric over the permittivity of vacuum. And you will notice, I hope, that uh, this thing has no units. Okay. Now, Probably I should tell you some representative values of permittivity for different materials, but the, the fact is that uh, almost all the time the, uh, the numbers that we work with are the values of the of kappa, of the, of, the, of the dielectric constant, and we rarely, uh, at least in the context of electric uh, uh, circuits, we rarely ever work with the permittivity directly. Okay. Uh, Typical values for kappa, remember it's unitless. Uh, let's see. The, uh, the key to think of, uh, the, key, the key to be thinking about as I write these numbers is that the closer the dielectric constant is to one, the more similar the dielectric material is to vacuum. So let's see. Uh, so vacuum, put it there for reference. Let me do this. You know, I'll make a table. Okay, so vacuum is by definition one. And what else do I have? I have uh, dry air. And that's pretty close. Uh, one, two, three, yeah. That's pretty close to vacuum. You can hardly tell the difference in the capacitor if there's air between the capacitor plates versus what it is vacuum, which is good. That means we don't have to try to worry about uh, having our, every one of our capacitors vacuum sealed. If you have air in between the plates, that, is, that essentially doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, that's, that's for dry air. If the air is not dry, yeah, let's say we have water vapor, which you get at 100 degrees Celsius. Then you get up to 1.00587, which we moved, at least we moved a decimal place over, over here. Compare this to this, three zeros here, just two zeros here. But still, water vapor is not no big deal. Um, here's one, though. Diamond, very, very good insulator. Its, it's dielectric constant is 5.7. So five, almost six times the permittivity of vacuum. Water, though, is much better than diamond, which and cheaper too. Although, for perhaps obvious reasons, water is rarely used in capacitors. Uh, but its its dielectric constant. Is, uh, what else? 
that's that's water. Ice at zero degrees, water ice, uh, is somewhat higher. Ninety-nine, and then just for fun, I did some googling around, and I found the dielectric constant, the largest dielectric constant I could find. And uh, I have no idea what this substance is, uh, but I like it anyway. And I'll put this here, I guess. And so potassium, tantalum, niobium oxide. And that comes out with a dielectric constant of 34,000. That amused me. Okay, so uh, any of these things inserted between the plates of a capacitor and uh, you'd end up being able to store considerably more charge in your capacitor. Okay. So that's good. So uh, that, that gives you the sense of what the dielectric is, what the numbers are, dielectric constant. And so I'm going to stop here, and then in the next recording, I'll actually uh, show you the calculations and how to calculate the uh, new capacitance uh, that the, uh, the that a vacuum capacitor would have after you've uh, uh, inserted some dielectric between the plates. Come back, won't you?